Well, good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Jessica Brown, and I'm the Children's Services Coordinator for the Pratt Library. So thank you all so much for signing up to be here. It's so much fun to be with librarians. We had some city schools teachers here last night, and they were so, like, sad and uh, tired. You guys are all so energetic and positive. It's such a nice change. I put the right field. I have the right job. <laughs> All right, so every child ready to read, uh, we're gonna kind of do a real crash course. There's so much more that you could do with this. You could really do a whole day training on every child ready to read. So we're just kind of gonna glaze over the, the highlights and kind of get you guys an introduction so that you can kind of decide if you want to kind of move forward and use this kind of curriculum in your library and think about ways that you could use it. So here's a little outline of what we're gonna cover. Um, first, I'm going to kind of get a sense from you guys about what you already know, in case you do have some sort of background. I don't want to spend too much time talking about things you, you already know about this curriculum. Um, we are going to talk about exactly what it is in the, in the detail sense so you understand that totally. Um, we're going to go over the current state of early literacy and school readiness a little bit so that you get a sense of the urgency of this work and kind of the genesis of it. Um, there is such a thing as the early literacy tree, which you all have a copy of, you see on the, that back table back there. Um, so we'll go over what that is and what that means in context of Every Child Ready to Read. We'll go over the five parenting practices, which are sort of the backbone of Every Child Ready to Read. That is sort of what the whole point of it is, so we'll go through each of those. Um, and then perhaps most importantly or most usefully, ways that you can use that curriculum in your library and then also to provide outreach. And then we'll take questions, but please feel free to interrupt me anytime along the way and ask questions as they come up. It's very informal, so no worries about that. So we'll start off. Tell me what you know about Every Child Tree. Just shout out buzzwords you've heard, things you know, things, you know, anything that you already know about it. Nothing is okay too. <laughs> okay, yes, excellent. There's a second version of it. We'll talk about that for sure in a little more detail. Any, anyone know anything else? Yeah. Yeah, the, the sing, talk, play, read, write. Yes, I, know, I think you get them all. Read, write, talk, sing, play. Yeah, yeah, there's five. So those are the parenting practices, so you know those. But do you know what they mean or how to kind of, do you know anything beyond just those words? It is birth to five. Yes. Yeah, you, it's good. Okay. Anything else? So I'm getting a sense that you don't have a totally comprehensive understanding of this. So crash course is appropriate. Okay. Good, good, good. That's, I just wanted to check. So I want to sh um, start off by sharing a video with you. Um, this was put out by the Holland Center for Language and Literacy, which is at the Atlanta School Speech School, the Atlanta Speech School. Um, and it's, it's not really aimed at us but it's talking to child care providers about the importance of talking with children. And so while you're watching it, just um, I want to talk to you afterwards about your reactions to it and maybe some of the things that you're thinking as you're, as you're watching it. And it's definitely tugs at the heartstrings. We're in trouble. It's getting worse. Our futures are at stake. The problem is teachers telling us to be quiet. And when they do want us to use our words, a lot of us don't have any. They want us to stop talking and pay attention. But I can't if I'm afraid I'll make them mad. We know that there are times when you need our attention. But if we keep on being quiet, we never learn how to use our words. And they will fall further and further behind. Let me show you where it starts. That's my friend on the changing table. There's our teacher, Miss Ellis. She always took good care of me, but I wish she would have talked with me. She just didn't know it was important. No one told her. This is the time that you need to start talking with children. We are beginning to put work together even though you may not understand us yet. So we want to learn from you. But the talking shouldn't stop there. That's Miss Fredericks. She never told me to be quiet, but she did tell me to catch a bubble or to zip it. I need you to catch a bubble. You need to stop talking. It is way too loud in the room. Catch a bubble? Are you kidding me? Why couldn't she just ask me to listen? Now, where do you think we'll be when we get to the third grade? 
we're gonna be behind. That's what's gonna happen. School's gonna be hard for us. We'll have trouble with reading, trouble with writing, trouble with everything. Yeah, for a lifetime. And that's why we need you. We need you to give our voices power. And here's how you can help us. When you're changing diapers, tell us about your day. Tell us about what you're doing. Oh. What did you enjoy doing today when we went outside? We love to hear your voice in new words. And when you want our attention, try singing to us. Or try this. Listen up. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? See what I mean? Don't be afraid to use big words with us. We have big ideas, and we need big words to share these ideas with you. And support our home language. It only takes a little effort on your part. You can learn a few words to grade us. Buenos dias. Hola. How are you? Good. Good? You ready to put your backpack up? You can take it out. Now that's not so hard, is it? First of all, get down on our level. Talk with us. Use your words. Ask us what we think, not what color a banana is. Give us the words that we need to solve problems on our own. We need you to make us a promise. We need you to promise us that you'll never tell us to be quiet again. I need you to catch a bubble. You need to stop talking. Why would you want to silence us? Can you promise us? Can you pinky promise us? Providers do it, or you know, teachers when they want kids to be quiet, so they do this, like, uh, you know, so you see I'm kind of doing that a lot. Um, so, what are your reactions to this? Does it make you think about anything? Does it make you think about libraries? What audience is that for? So, it's for child care providers. It's so, I think the, the thing that I really underscores it for me is the when they're talking to that one teacher and she says, you know, she just didn't know she was supposed to talk to me. Like, she didn't know that when she's changing my diaper, she should be asking me questions and telling me about the day. So it, it was just sort of to kind of bring attention to the fact that it's just about sharing that knowledge, which is kind of why I wanted you guys to see it. It's the, sort of the point of Every Child Ready to Read, too. Yes? Talking about Einstein, Einstein's theory of relativity, as long as you don't expect them to understand that. Sure. You know? But just, just talk to them. Read them books, because then you're, you're using words that potentially you don't use in your everyday life. Exactly. That's a great point. Yeah. And other reactions? Yeah. I mean, even going beyond first and five, we just had kindergarten classes come and do a couple of times and the tours in the library. And I can't tell you how stunned the kids are when we tell them they don't have to be quiet. Oh. All the teachers are looking around and they're like, we told them they have to be quiet in the library and they're like, not quiet. No, no we don't. When we're in the space, we're supposed to be loud. When the puppet talks to you, you're supposed to yell and talk back. And it's, it's a very hard stereotype to break. Yeah. People think library and they tell them they have to be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Oh, and also, I try to use books during my story time where the kids have to repeat a phrase that's, you know, that's used a couple of times. Sure. And I'll say, now remember, when I do this, you're, you're going to say, yes, I can, or whatever the case mm -hmm. is. You know, yeah. So just they, you know, they can, they can talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did I see a hand over here, too? Did you have? Go ahead. It, it just kind of makes me think about the teachers and the educators not receiving that proper training and instruction mm -hmm. too. And I mean, we can try to partner, but I feel like it illustrates the problem being deeper in terms of have the teachers or the, I don't know, the daycare. I don't know, just wishing that infrastructure and support system was a little bit better as yeah. well. Absolutely, sure. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that you'll find you can use this curriculum for. There is a whole section 
of it that's just geared towards sharing it with community partners and stakeholders um, so that you can, you can kind of empower them with some of this language to know that it is okay to do these things or that they should be doing those things. And then we can reinforce it in the library, to your point, of encouraging kids to talk and sing and play in the library as well. So thank you for, for sharing your reactions. I just think it's like when the kids are telling you, like, don't tell me to be cool. Uh, just, just, oh, it gets me every time. <laughs> so here are some absolute very basics about the curriculum, or as I like to call it, the stuff everyone assumes is obvious, but maybe is actually not. So, um, ALSC and PLA joined forces um, almost a decade ago to work on the first edition of Every Child Ready to Read, which was, yes, I'm sorry, I do not know what ALSC is. Oh, sure. So ALSC is the Association for Library Service to Children, and PLA is the Public Library Association. So there's a joint, there's actually a joint committee that worked on this and continues to work on it. Actually, Dorothy Soltz from Carroll County is the current chair of that committee. Um, so we have some strong Maryland representation with this work, which is awesome. So those two organizations were responding to the sense of urgency that they felt kind of in response to that video, some of the themes of that video, which is there's a real crisis here of not preparing children to enter kindergarten, and we need to address that. Um, so this is geared toward children ages 0 to 5 primarily, although I think you could really use it going up a little further as well. So you were right about that, 0 to 5. The first edition came out in 2004, and it was very much geared toward early literacy skills. So it taught, the idea was to teach parents what these skills are so that they knew how to reinforce them at home. So it you know, talked about phonological awareness and phonemes and background knowledge and all those kind of education terms. So then they evaluated the first edition and they found out that that's really not a very successful approach to teaching early literacy and that the crucial thing is not so much that they know what phonological awareness is, but rather that they know what practice they can do to develop phonological awareness with their child. So then the second edition came out in 2011 and that edition focused on five parenting practices that nourish and encourage the literacy skill development in children. So they kind of decided it wasn't as important to make sure everyone knew what, what that phonological awareness was, but really how they could practice those things at home. So it is an actual kit curriculum that you can buy. It's $200. They sell it in the ALA store, which is kind of a hefty price tag. Um, but what it includes is a hard copy of the curriculum, which I will pass around for you all to see. Hefty. And along with that, you get a DVD with videos on it, which we'll see a couple of those today. Um, copies of a bunch of different PowerPoints. I'm actually using, this is the PowerPoint kind of format that you get. I've obviously tailored it to this presentation, and you certainly can do that, and I encourage you to. Um, but it gives you all the backgrounds and kind of all the facts. So you could, you could really use it out of the box if you wanted to. Um, and then it does have some supporting materials in it as well. So before you run out and buy this, I do believe that every library system in the state has a copy. It probably lives with your youth services coordinator if your system has one. Um, but DLDS, uh, the Division of Library Development and Services of MSDE, bought that for us all. So before you run out at your branch and go buy it, make sure you find out if it's already in existence. Yes? I have a question about the DVD. Mm -hmm. Does that include um, DVD videos for so we'll see a couple of them. So the DVDs are, or the, the videos that are on the DVD are sort of modeling parenting practices. So there'll be a clip of a parent talking to a child and a clip of a parent reading to a child. So my, the second question to that I have for people here, has anyone done a program in their system for parents, like an evening program for parents? Some libraries have. Um, St. Mary's County has done that pretty successfully. And they've done several family literacy nights. A lot of the um, libraries that have already rolled out the Race to the Top Parent Library cafes have used a lot of this language with that too. Um, I think, I want to say Carroll County has used it. I don't want to say that without knowing for sure. Okay, so yeah, so there are libraries that are using it in a family night kind of model. And you'll see in the curriculum there are three pieces that you get. One is a piece that's geared towards staff or to community stakeholders, so it's kind of talking to the practitioners. Then there's a chunk of the um, curriculum that's designed just for parents alone, so if you were doing a solo parent workshop. 
And then there's a chunk that's for a situation where a parent and a child are in the room together. Um, so there, I mean, it just depends on what works for your community and, and what makes the most sense. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, there is a Spanish language version of this, which is very recent. You can see it came out in 2014. Um, it's $99 and it's electronic only, so you don't get the printed curriculum binder like you see coming around. You just get to download the PDFs of all of the curriculum. Um, but it is much needed and I'm really glad that they finally put that all together. Um, and there are other items that you can purchase from the ALA store too. There's posters, there's bookmarks. I have a sample here of a brochure that you can get that talks about the parenting practices. We'll go, we'll go through this in more detail. But this is what you might want to use for outreach or as a giveaway. And you can customize most of the stuff or the space for your library's information on the back of it too. So just keep that in mind. So I'll pass this around as well. All right, so those are the very basics. So again, what really drove all of this was national research and studies that were showing that children were entering kindergarten without the skills necessary to learn how to read. So I just want to be clear that we're not teaching kids how to read. This is not like a phonics curriculum. It's not a reading program. Um, it's helping parents prime kids' minds with the knowledge that they'll need to be able to learn how to read when they get to kindergarten. Does that make sense? Okay. So is anyone familiar with Annie Casey's study on grade level reading? No, okay, then I'll explain it. So um, the Annie Casey Foundation conducted a study kind of seeing, they wanted to know what the tipping point was. So where was it in a child's educational career that we could sort of figure out, predict their future success? So they found out that that's actually as early as third grade. And it makes a lot of sense, actually, when you think about where a child is developmentally and intellectually. So in the sort of grades before third, so pre-K to grade two, children are really learning how to read. You know, they're, being, they're learning sight words, or practicing their letters, their alphabet, sounding out words. But then what happens in third grade is everything kind of flips. And so instead of learning how to read, they are expected to read in order to learn. So you can imagine what that snowballing effect would have so if kids are coming out, you know, they're five years old, they're going into kindergarten, and they haven't had any kind of priming to be ready to learn how to read, they're going to be set back. And they're going to try to catch up, and if they don't, they're going to be set back. And they're just going to keep on being set back until they get to third grade, and no one's teaching them how to read anymore, and they hand them a packet and say, read this, and then we're going to do homework on it later, and we're going to have a test on it. And they can't read that, so then they're falling behind, and it just continues to snowball throughout their educational career. So what Casey sort of showed was that in third grade, you can tell more or less if a child will be able to graduate from high school based on their reading level in third grade. So this graph here kind of illustrates that. So the salmon color, kind of pink colors, are percentages of children who are high school graduates, and the blue are children who are not high school graduates. And you can see um, children who are, it kind of goes left to right, children who are below, at, and above grade level. So as you would kind of guess, but this proves, that the children who are either at or above graduated high school at a higher rate than children who are below. Um, you can kind of see the graph going opposites. So, you know, this is a really big deal. Um, and what Casey kind of realized is that there's more to this. So it doesn't just start in third grade. It actually starts when kids are born. Um, and that there's literacy priming and literacy skills that they need to have to be successful in kindergarten, which will just carry on to their success throughout. Yes? Um, I heard one at one point one state, I want to say Wisconsin, that they would look at third grader, uh, especially boys, their reading level, and they could tell, okay, in 10 years when they're 18, we know how many beds we're going to need now when they're in third grade for jail. Personally. I've heard that too. Yeah. I, don't know if that, I don't know if that's actually true. I've not seen the study, but I've heard, I've heard that too. Yeah. So third grade's a big deal. So anyways, all this to say that we got to catch them when they're young, and here's proof why. Here's the data to support it. So one thing that the kit really underscores and that is important for you to make sure you're emphasizing to your parents and families if you're going to actually kind of lead one of these workshops with them is that they are absolutely crucial to developing their child's early literacy skills. We've known this in the library. Obviously, we do story times with the caregiver in the room. Um, but it's, I think it's important to say that to parents, that they are actually their child's first teacher. So this slide is actually right out of the box. 
from the curriculum. Um, so you can kind of leave it there and just help explain to parents why they're so important. Um, but the, really the biggest thing is that children learn best by doing, and they like to do things with people that they love, and that would be the adult or the caregiver in their life. Um, so it's, I just think it's really nice to be able to make sure you're saying this to your parents so that they, um, it's kind of reinforced. I think a lot of times there's a misconception that learning doesn't start until my child goes to school. Right, so and that's we know that's not true. So it's important to just sort of be able to say that to them. So at this point, if you want to grab out your early literacy tree, that will help you be able to see a little better than what I have up here on the screen. So this was actually developed by Saroj Godin. You may have heard her name before. She's really big in the early literacy scene nationally um, with libraries, and it was developed by. Uh, Virginia Libraries and um, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So this is, you can download this from the internet. I think Saroj has it up on her website. I think the I think IMLS might actually have it too. So if you did want to reproduce it for um, a workshop, you'd be able to do that. So what I like about this is that it really illustrates how all of these things kind of lock together. So I mentioned that they really focused on early literacy skills in the first edition and switch to talking about practices in the second. But what's nice is this kind of shows you how those things interlock, right? So you have your roots of your tree kind of as the foundation, and then the limbs are all of these skills that are then nourished and supported by the sun, or in this case, the parent practices. So I think it's a really nice visual to be able to, I don't know that parents would necessarily be as, as interested, but maybe your staff and child care providers would need to know this, especially because child care providers might have a background in early literacy, so they may be familiar with the skills and not understand how that connects to the practices. So oral language is really the stuff that a child is getting. So they're listening, they're speaking, they're cooing, they're giggling, they're communicating. Um, as early as four months old, they can tell the difference between a happy face and an angry or a sad face. So it starts very, very early. So this would just be sort of the, that's why it's sort of a foundation. These are the things they're getting right from the beginning. So then phonological awareness is really their ability to hear smaller parts of words. Um, it's also environmental sounds like a doorbell or a dog barking um, or a car horn, things like that. That's why rhyming is so important because it reinforces parts of words and sounds of words. And also syllables, so when you break words down into smaller parts, that helps reinforce it. So any of you who might use Mother Goose on the Loose curriculum, there's a part where you kind of have each child hit their name in syllables on a drum, and that's in part to reinforce this. So then vocabulary, that's sort of obvious, that's words that they know. It's not actually being able to define words, but rather it's all of their kind of background knowledge of words, words that they've been exposed to. So it's not necessarily that they know the word, but that they've heard it before. Background knowledge also includes print motivation and narrative skills, um, and that's all of the knowledge that they have. There are four kind of different types. There's general knowledge, social knowledge of things like you say excuse me when you bump into someone, or you say please and thank you. There's conceptual thinking, which is really about cause and effect and being able to predict. It's a lot of what we do when we share stories and we ask kids questions while we share stories. We're helping them predict what's going to come next. There's content knowledge, which is just factual, hard information that they know. And then there's book and story knowledge, which are sort of that things have a beginning and middle and end, that you turn pages, that there's an author and an illustrator, all of those kind of pieces. So that's all considered background knowledge. And then print awareness is understanding that print has meaning, so that what we speak is actually also written. Um, it's also being able to identify things like the M and the McDonald's logo, so the environmental things. And then we also have letter knowledge, and that is actually just knowing letters. Um, but on a very basic level, it's also being able to recognize shapes, because of course letters are made up of shapes. Um, and also being able to distinguish between things that are the same and different, because if you are learning the alphabet, you know that there are sometimes very subtle differences between letters. So if you think about lowercase letter N and lowercase letter H, there is one tiny difference in the stem length between the two of them. So if kids are able to distinguish things that are the same and different, that helps them learn their letters as well. So those are the skills that kind of grow up out of that initial foundation of, of um, oral language. And then, of course, our parenting practices, which we've said before, talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing, are the sunshine, sort of the things that we do to reinforce those skills. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, I was at a restaurant eating, and 
and um, there was a mom sitting here and referring to my little girl. And every time the girl saw me take her cup, my cup to drink, or she grabbed her sippy cup, she looked at me and go, cheers. <laughs> you know, she, she didn't under, really understand, but she knew to hold the cup and say cheers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So she's got that background knowledge. It's like knowing excuse me or please. It's one of those social cues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so in order for kids to learn how to read, there's two things they have to be able to do. The first is actually learn a code. So that's essentially the alphabet. And then the second is to actually understand what that means. So because you all already know how to read, I guess, I'm hoping, um, it's hard to kind of recreate what that feels like. So if you look at this slide, you can see they've assigned some generic symbols to our alphabet. So if you're working on decoding this, can you, can you, can anyone explain what that sentence is in red, what that says? I heard it. I can read. I can read. So this is the process that essentially a child has to go through when they're seeing squiggles on a page. I don't know what that means. So before they can even understand the meaning of something, they have to actually be able to, to read it and to understand, you know, to see it coming out there. So the second part is understanding the meaning. So it's one thing to be able to read the thing, but it's another to actually comprehend it. So sometimes you might see kids in your library who actually can read something really difficult, like War and Peace or something, but they are not understanding at all any of the meaning of that book because they can read the words, but there's a different step in being able to understand it. So this example here is pretty simple. So Leah is hippel when she rocks with her mom. I'm perfectly capable of reading all of those words. I have no idea what hippel means and no idea what rocks means. Now, what kids can do if they have a good kind of background knowledge and they're using context clues, they can look at the picture and they can use the other words in the sentence and then they might start to guess what it means. Anyone have a guess of what this is actually saying? Yes. Happy when she reads with her mom. Yes, Leah is happy when she reads with her mom. We, we kind of deducted that. But like I said, I can read those words, but I don't know what, I didn't know what they were. So just because I could read them didn't know, mean that I had the meaning. So I think that's important you know, to understand, especially sometimes when you see kids in your library, again, who can read at a very high level but may not be comprehending. So this is where the, the parenting practices really come in. So it took all of this research um, and it turned it into jargon-free terms. So rather than telling our parents, this is phonological awareness, and they look at you like, I don't know what that is, I don't want to be in school anymore, like, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to know. So it takes all of that and turn, it takes out the jargon and it turns it into simple practices that parents can do at home. So the, the most important message are those five words, read, write, talk, sing, and play. Read, write, talk, sing, and play, which is right here on this next sl slide. So you've got it in your um, handout. So going through these practices, the first is talking. This is a slide that's taken right out of the package, so you can kind of see what it looks like. So you're going to you know, help people understand that children learn language by listening to parents talk and joining in the conversation. Has anyone heard of the 30 million word gap? Have you heard that thrown around? Some of you? So there's, there was a research study that was conducted that um, pretty much determined that kids who um, come from families who are more affluent have heard, on average, 30 million more words than children who come from a lower socioeconomic status by the time they start school. 30 million words. So that talking piece to that video that we watched, that's why that's so important. That's all that background knowledge that they need, all of those kind of words that they've been exposed to. Um, so that's why it's so important to really reinforce that with parents and with um, child care providers. So one thing that I really like that this curriculum does, again, a slide that's taken straight from the package, I think a lot of times adults who don't speak English as their first language get hung up on not wanting to make their kids be speaking not English. And what this is telling them is really they should speak always in the language that they feel most comfortable in. It's worse actually for a child not to hear any language at all than it is for them to hear it all in French and then learn the English translation when they go to school or when they're in childcare. So um, please make sure if you do have families that don't speak English natively that you encourage them to continue to talk with their children regardless. So talking, again, the slide that comes from the curriculum, they talk about using rich talk with the children. And rich talk just means, as, as opposed to telling a child, go get that for me. 
If you point to it instead, instead and say, please go get me that red round ball, then they've just got three words that they may not have had before because you explained to them in a little bit more detail what it was you actually wanted them to get. So that's what rich talk is. Um, it's also important to take turns with the child, even if they're an infant. So instead of just babbling on and on and on and on and on, and on and reading, reading them from the newspaper, it helps to actually have a conversation with them. So you saw in that video that the teacher said, oh, what did you like when we went outside today? Clearly that child was like, ah, on the, on the changing table. But she paused and let them answer. And that's helping them learn what that process is like. They're thinking, like they're hearing what you're saying and they're taking that in. So it gives them time to process what they're hearing. Um, and then eventually, and they might actually respond to you with a babble or a goo or some slobber or something. So it's, you know, it's still important to, to have them those pauses. You can also make connections for them between what you're talking to them about and other things they may see. So with that red round ball example, you might say, can you get me that red round ball over there, please? And then when they bring it to you, do you remember that you have two others of balls in the other room? One's blue and one's green, just like this one. So you're helping them connect things that are similar that they may have seen in their environment. So I'm going to show you a video. This is one of the videos that comes with the curriculum that's modeling a parent talking to a toddler. And so while you're watching it, just, just think about some of the things that, this, that the video might be demonstrating to parents. All right, let's make some eggplant for lunch today. This right here is eggplant. See that? Eggplant. It's good. It's in a lot of Italian food. It's kind of squishy. Feel that? See? Well, that's fun, huh? Eggplant. Got to cut off the top. That right there we don't use. We can throw that in a little bowl. And then we cut it in half. So we have one onion. And now how many pieces do we have? One. Two. You want to smell it? Smell it. <laughs> Strong. Here, put this in the junk bowl. Put it in here. All right, good job. Don't forget this spot, too. Get that spot. Get right there. Good boy. All right, all done. Finished. Yay! All right, so what are some of your thoughts about that? What is it demonstrating? What did you hear that you thought was, was good to see modeled? I liked that he would even say, now we're just going to put it in the bowl. Mm -hmm. Like, he didn't just stop with cutting off the top. Yeah, and then later, that's a good point. The onion, now let's put it in the junk bowl. Yes. Exactly. So that again. Right. So there were the, there was sort of the main activity and then secondary. Right. Sense. Follow through. So he's narrating everything that he's doing instead of just stopping after he said, "This is a nice plan." Yeah, it's a great point. Yes. Um, I think it's great that after he said that this is a nice plan, he let him touch it because, mm -hmm. as we know, there are different types of learners. So you know, it's not only just listening to the words, but you know, getting to feel it and know that that. When you touch that, that's an eggplant. Yeah. Yeah. And the smell. And the smell. Great point. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes? Kind of tagging on to what you just said, in, in that way it was just a story. Yes. Mm -hmm. But um, so the child felt like he, I mean, he felt the piano. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. felt like he did it along with yes. that parent and not just, you know, it's not just an obvious. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So I've been doing that with my son since 15 months. The whole like smelling thing. I'll forget. I'll just be cutting or doing something, and he'll reach up and like sniff stuff. <laughs> He's like, No, no, mom. This is the smell time. You know? <laughs> smell. Time to smell. Don't yeah. forget that part. Right. Because we did it. We've created that yeah. as part right, of it's our routine. Right. It's a habit now. So exactly. It's habit, even if it's not mine. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Better than sitting in front of the table. 
Right. And he's learning how to cook. And clean. And clean. So he can help you when he's six. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So and, uh, the other thing I think he does really well is he, he does pause. So when he was asking him about how many halves, he had, how many pieces do I have, he gave a slight pause as if we were going to answer and accounted for him. Um, and I think it's nice too, to your point, you don't need flashcards to sort of teach your kid eggplant with a picture of an eggplant on it, or you know, number cards with one and two. You know, they will learn those things by being talked to about them. Um, so I really like that clip, and again, that clip comes with the curriculum, so you, you know, you don't have to go seeking those things out. Did I see another hand? Yes. Well, one of the things that I got when I was watching it, and, and it connects with um, what she was just saying about parents, to me, parenting is much more fun <laughs> when you do that. Yeah, it is much more fun. It's really interesting, and if you engage with them, it's more fun yeah. than just standing there. Yeah. Sitting next to you playing with some Cheerios on exactly. a tray. And just, I mean, he was, you know, obviously he was making a good video. One of them, like he was having a good time. Of course. But I think he was having fun. Yeah. I do think he was having fun. Yeah, absolutely. I think he thought it was his show. Oh, yeah. I mean, what's his show next? What's going on? Yeah, it's like a magic trick. Like I said, watching Dory, he's watching Dad chop the next show. Absolutely. Yes. He seemed perfectly happy and excited to be there. And again, to Becky's point, if that's his routine, that's his habit of sitting, and he's been doing that since he was, a, you know, able to sit upright. Then, you know, then he'll be fine. He'll, enter, he'll be entertained by that process. Great. All right. Well, moving on here. I do embed usually when I use this training additional ways that people can do each of these practices with their children. Um, and I try to do things that don't cost any money or would be used with things that are around the house so that they're not thinking they have to buy some expensive educational set of something or others. It's really just about the basics. So talking about environmental print, pointing out shapes and colors, things that we do in our story times all the time. Um, playing the letter game, so we're going to go eat at a place that starts with a letter M. Where do you think we're going? They may not answer, or they may, may take them five times before they get it right, but you're going to reinforce that for them so they start to connect McDonald's with the M, sort of, so it kind of goes that way. And then, of course, always finding things that are relevant and important to the child. So, oh, look, toothpaste starts with T. Tanya, your first name starts with T, too. And they'll be more inclined to remember it if it's all about them, because that's how kids are. All right, any questions about talking? So one last point on that is storytelling. Um, something that we do in libraries, of course, I think something that's intimidating for parents, but what I like about these two examples is that they're not retelling you know, a fable or a folk tale or a fairy tale. They're just telling the kid about what they liked to do when they were little or the story of the day that they were born. Things that they should be able to recall pretty quickly and easily and they wouldn't be too intimidated to retell because they own that story. So that's a great thing to point out to parents when you do the talking segment, is that they can just talk about stories, family stories, that are important to them. So the next skill is singing. This might be the one that actually hangs parents up the most. I think it hangs us up sometimes the most, because you, know, you don't want to be singing in front of people, or you feel silly, or you feel embarrassed. But it's so, so important. So again, here's you know, the slide that comes right out of the kit, talks about singing. Um, how it develops literacy, uh, excuse me, listening skills, how it slows language down so kids can hear the individual parts. So if you think about when you sing Twinkle Twinkle, you know, you're singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So you're really exaggerating each of the sounds in that, the words in that song. So it's really important. And then of course they're going to learn new words by hearing songs. So I would like to always say, like, I don't say twinkle in my everyday language. Um, but of course, when you sing twinkle, twinkle, little star, you're giving the child a piece of vocabulary that they wouldn't have had before. Yes? Well, I know this with children, because I do not have a little voice. I don't even know if they want to talk. But anyway, um, they don't care. They don't they, care at all. They can't sing. As long as you get the words right and the <laughs> movements right. You've got to get those two right. Right. You know, because I was doing one, two, buck your shoes, and then it was three, four, shut the door, and I was saying, close the door, and there's one little girl yells out, it shut the door! Like, <laughs> you know, so right. she didn't care how I sang. Right, exactly. Know? And then another kid, I, I was babysitting and doing, doing Annie, you know, and I was, of course, Miss Hannigan. 
So I was just making up stuff. Oh, no, 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 we have to do this. So, you know, they don't care. No, they don't care if, if you're, you know, Beyonce. It's really, it's okay. <laughs> parents might want you to be, but you're not. It's okay. Um, so, yes, encourage parents to sing familiar songs, things they know. If they have a favorite, not too raunchy version of a radio song that they like, they can sing that to a kid. It's all good. Um, clapping out rhythms and the syllables to words, like in the child's name, that goes back to that mother goose on the loose concept I was telling you about with the drumming, the syllables, and the child's name. And then, of course, making up songs, totally just pulling them out of the blue about the chores you're doing or the you know, trip you're taking in the car on the bus somewhere. All of that works too. So, um, really simple things. Yes? Um, something that I was talking about was daycare providers in the town um, and at a family uh, cafe night. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, it's so easy to do. I mean, yeah. right, then they love it, they laugh, it's funny, yeah, it's like your inside joke thing that you share yeah. with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any questions about singing before we move on? All right, so our next practice is reading. Uh, obvious one, really. Um, you'll see there's a little tiny note down here on the left hand side of the slide. Again, this is a package slide from the curriculum. Um, that reading is the single most important way to help children get ready to read. So you might want to underscore that um, when you're t talking about this with parents or with child care providers. Um, reading obviously develops vocabulary and comprehension. I think the most important things are those two, second and third bullet points. Um, it nurtures a love for reading, right? We know that, we're in the business, um, but I think it's important to remind parents of that. And also that ultimately it's going to motivate a child to want to learn how to read if it's something that they love to do with you and you're the one who can do it and they want to be like you, then it's going to all come full circle and they'll really be excited about learning. So um, I think those, are, those two points are really important. So there are lots of ways to read with children that don't involve actually reading the book. We know this, but I think it's really important to tell parents that because I think sometimes there's this anxiety it's like the I must finish the book anxiety that adults have that. Like, it's a horrible book, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to slog through it. Right? So I always tell kids, life's too short. If you're not reading it for school, give it up. Right? So I think it's important to empower parents like that, too, that your child may not be paying, you may not feel like they're paying attention to every word, or maybe they're bored after five minutes, and that's totally okay. There are also other ways you can share books, like doing a picture walk. Has anyone heard of this concept before? A couple of you? So the picture walk idea is just that you read a book with a child, but you don't ever read the text on the pages. You read the pictures, more or less. So you're telling the story of the pictures on the page. Um, you are helping the child learn new words. They're taking turns. You, if they're a speaking age, you can have them tell the story of the pictures that they're seeing in the book. It's like a new book every time. Um, it's particularly useful if you have parents who are of a lower literacy level, and they may have their own issues or hang-ups or intimidations about reading. If you give them a wordless picture book, there's nothing they can read. They don't have a choice. They have to tell the story of the pictures. And that might be a really successful way to help them be involved with reading with their child. Um, you could also have people make a book. You could do that at one of your family nights if you wanted to. If they bring family photos, they could do a book about the story of their family. Um, and also encourage parents to share board books. We have many of them. Um, but there's that whole, a book is sacred, do not rip the book, the book stays on the shelf kind of concept that we want to bust through, and board books are a really good way to make that happen. So I want to share another video with you from the curriculum, and this is of a parent and child sort of doing a picture walk. They speak, super shit, stop, stop. And the elephant is, he's right there. Elephant's getting out first. The elephant gets out. Now the somebody not holding it. The, the mouse. Did the mouse hold it? Hold what? A banana. Now we're getting tired. They're all getting tired. Yeah. Who else is coming? Tell me about this. Huh? 
this one. What's that? I don't know. The hyena and just a giraffe. This is um the little one and the big um his sister and his daddy. His daddy's coming too. Okay, so that was a little harder to hear. Plus, she's like a three-year-old, and she's not really <laughs> easy to understand. But any reactions to that? Thoughts? What did you see the mother doing? What did you ask about the child? Yes, Lisa. Um, well, you know, the child is sort of telling the story to the mother, and it's kind of nice because she's developing um, skills that she'll need um, when she actually learns how to read text, like understand context. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm using the pictures for context clues yeah. if you don't know the word. Right. Excellent. Yeah, really good. Yes? I like when little girl was saying, I don't know, and then mom was just encouraging mm -hmm. her. Prompting her to give an answer. Yeah, it was like, oh, that looks like daddy's stuff. You know, yep, yep, exactly. Yeah, great point. Yes? I actually didn't like it. It was supposed to be a bad example, and she wouldn't have her touch the book, she wouldn't have her turn the pages, you know, she wasn't you know, she'd give like one or two or so, so to me that was a deal what you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's the right answer, but it actually made me cringe. Yeah, it's not supposed to be a bad example. But uh -huh. you could I mean you could use it that way. I think the thing to emphasize emphasize about it is that we heard the mother speak like two times. Exactly. Which is kind of cool. You know, it really was the child telling the story and kind of directing things. And yeah, the mother was trying to I think help her focus on the pages without getting too far ahead. So I think it depends on how you'd want to use it and, and maybe how you how you explain it. So yeah, I agree with you that okay. it, it could be frustrating and she kind of is like, uh, a little yeah. bored at times maybe. <laughs> um, but I think the important thing for your families to see is that the child was totally reading that story without reading the words. That's the point of that clip, I think. Well, then I clearly miss it. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, this is why it's good to watch the videos before you show them. <laughs> other, other reactions? Yes. Well, I, mean, I agree. I was struggling with the fact that she, the mother, could say a whole lot. Of, she asked a couple of questions for clarification. Right. But when the little girl said something about their brother and sister, and she just, I mean, she never at any point said, no, 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 sweetie, no, look, look, this is what, you know, she never corrected her story mm -hmm. or redirected it. She let it just flow. Let it go. Exactly. Which was good. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other comments? Okay. So the next practice is writing, which obviously goes hand in hand with reading. This is a slide right from the curriculum, so you can embellish it if you wanted to. So I think what's important, that, and this is another of the slides from the curriculum, is to kind of show parents the progression of a child's writing and, and to value all of it. So just because when they are very small and they're pretty much just making marks on a page or scribbling, that it's still a part of this longer process that's happening that's walking them towards being able to write independently. So from the making marks phase, of course, they're able to draw something that more closely resembles a person, a very round person. Um, and then from there, they may be picking up some letters, but they may not have mastery of all of them. So they'll start to just kind of write out the letters that they know. Um, I think I see dad in there a few times, but then there's just other random letters. But this is still important, and they don't necessarily need to be corrected. They're just trying to own that process of writing the letters that they do know. Then, of course, the big one, writing your name. They're going to master that one and be very proud of it. And then hopefully from there, they'll be able to do some more writing. So this one's kind of hard to see, but this is written by Saul. And he drew a picture of himself next to like a castle. I think it's like a sand castle situation. And he says, I am going to make a castle. And castle is spelled K-A-S-O-L. And make is spelled M-E-K. Mm -hmm. So the point is that, okay, it's not totally right, but he's got his sentence structure down. He's describing it. He's got some complicated language in there. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big step forward. So I think helping parents understand that your child is not wrong or bad or stupid, God forbid, for, for not being able to spell castle off the bat, that this is an important part of their process. So this might be something really helpful to share with your families um, when you're talking about writing. So then here, again, just some ways that you can write with children, things you can encourage parents to do, the obvious things like tracing letters, um, but then you can actually have them mold or make letters, so forming them out of clay, um, writing their name in a tray of rice, so you basically just fill the bottom of the tray with rice and then have them sort of trace it so the negative image comes out of the letter. 
Um, you can do shaving cream in the bathtub. There are so many different ways to write. That's a little bit easier one for parents to grasp because they have writing utensils and things around the house. Um, but it can happen in a lot of different ways. Any questions about writing? Yes. Okay. So, um, <coughs> I mean, for us as librarians, how would the zero to five scouting do you guys incorporate writing at all into story times? Because I find that's the one thing that's lacking for us uh, my story. So the question was, how do you incorporate writing into your story times? Because if you're not doing craft, yeah. you're not going to do a craft. Yes. I use scarves, and we make shapes in the air. That's a good one. Making shapes in the air with scarves. Other ideas? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't know. We do some other programs besides like the weekly story times or like the Come Learn With Me, and there you maybe have some more. I mean, granted, it's you know, maybe like that two to five year old, but right. you have some more um, options to okay. incorporate writing or mm -hmm. cutting out letters or, mm -hmm. you know, play that or Yeah, so Absolutely. that gives you a better way Yeah. Another thing you can do is the tracing letters in the hand, like with, you know, uh, pat a cake, pat a cake, but you could do more, comp have the parent either trace the child's name in their hand or have take the child's hand and trace it in the parents, things like that, too. Um, so there's some subtle ways you can do it. This um, tape on the floor thing is kind of fun, so you can have that set up ahead of time and then have them play on the letters that you've spelled out, you spell library or story time or something like that. Um, any other suggestions of ways you guys are using writing? You can also leave handouts too, like letter tracing sheets or things that parents can take home too. Because writing is a little bit harder to do if you're not going to do craft time afterwards to involve that in story time. Oh yes, in the back. Um, we have a children's computer in our area and we've been seeing more and more kids gravitating towards beginning typing. Would like picking out letters on a keyboard fall under the writing, or is that a little bit more towards like reading writing? It's a weird a little, stage. Yeah, it's weird. It probably supports both. I think it's a little bit more reading and letter recognition than it is actual command of making the shapes and making the letters. But I think it bridges the gap, certainly. Yeah. Any other things about writing? Okay. So the last one is playing. Um, and this one might not seem obvious to families. We obviously we've embraced play for decades in the library since the dawn of time. Um, so, but it's important, again, this is a slide from the curriculum that children learn through different kinds of play. And one thing I think it's helpful to explain to parents is that the way that children engage in dramatic play is similar to them understanding that words represent spoken sounds, that written word is also spoken. So, for example, if they're playing pirates, and one of the kids has a cardboard tube that they're using as a telescope, they know it's not a real telescope, but they understand that it's representing a telescope in their play. And that's the same thing with words, that what's written on the page is representing what they're speaking. Um, so it is, it is reinforcing a pretty intense concept, even though you know, they may not be reading while they're playing, necessarily. So here are some ways to play together that you could share with your parents. I think they're sort of obvious things. Um, matching games are really good about same and different, which we talked about with letter recognition, so they can get those subtleties of language. Um, acting out a role or a situation is really important to give kids a safe space to explore what those things are. So if they have a hang about going to the doctor, it's fun to play doctor at home and make them realize that it's something fun, that they don't have anything to be scared of. Of course, we want to encourage families to play act going to the library, of course. Um, but other things that are just in their routine, it's really important to have them play act those so they feel comfortable and empowered in those situations. So any play is sort of an obvious one. Any, but any other questions or anything about play? Okay. So the last thing that the um, curriculum makes sure that, that you say to families is that it's important to have the home be a learning zone. You might have heard them call it cozy corner. That's been a catchphrase for a little while. But the concept is basically just that there is a place in every home that is okay for the child to go to and play in whenever they'd like to, within reason. So that there are books around, there are toys around, there's a safe, clean, comfortable space that the child can own and take advantage of. That's something that this curriculum really advocates for. Um, and that kids will use the books more, they'll use the toys more, they'll engage more if they actually have them out and can see them and can play with them whenever they'd like to. Um, again, within reason, but just so that there is a dedicated space for a child that they can be in. 
So that's one thing that the curriculum talks about. Um, I've heard Head Start teachers really do encourage families to have this cozy corner concept. That, that's the phrase I've always heard them use. Um, so you might have the, the care providers be familiar with that idea when you um, give this lesson to them. So any questions about the cozy corner? Okay, so then the last part of the curriculum gives you an opportunity to tailor a slide to all of the awesome things that your library does for zero to five year olds and their families. So you can talk about resources, CDs, any of the other things that you have that you offer, you can kind of customize this slide. And that's sort of how they wrap up the um, training for parents. Any questions about that? Okay, so ways that you can use this curriculum um, at your library. So there are several different things you can do. Um, in the library, a lot of places are adopting these five parenting practices as a part of their regular story time. So they either kind of use that as the skeleton, so they always want to make sure they're doing something to reinforce reading, writing, talking, singing, and playing. Um, and they'll build activities around that. So that's one approach you can take. Um, the other would be to use asides. I do have a video here, but I'm, I'm worried about time, so I don't want to. I, I will encourage you to go and watch it. It's actually Saroj going, and she's just modeling what a parental aside looks like. And so basically all that is that you're taking even just 30 seconds to explain to the parents why you've just done something or are going to do something so that they understand, oh, there's a reason why she's saying who the author and illustrator are of this book, or there's a reason why you know, she's having us trace letters in the air. Um, just giving the parents that heads up so they kind of are clued in that this is something important that they can be doing at home. So you don't really have to brand your story time as an every child or each read story time or anything like that. It's just a way for you to really include these tools and these practices as, as kind of familiar language for your families to reinforce the practices. Um, a lot of places are designing or labeling their play spaces with the, the five parenting practices. Are any of your library systems doing that? Yes, what, uh, your library system again? PG County. PG County. Anyone else doing that? Frederick? Yeah. I knew that. You guys have that brand new space in Cedar Arts, right? Yeah, probably. Can't even talk about it, so cool. Yeah, so, so it's a really, it's really, you can retrofit your current play spaces if you'd like to put up little signs about ways that they can use the kitchen and how that's reinforcing dramatic play, or put books out there and talk about reading. So you can retrofit your space if you wanted to. But I know a lot of systems are kind of embracing that language to do that. Um, you can host family literacy nights or every child ready to read nights or parent literacy parties or whatever you want to call them, um, where you offer stations and activities to reinforce the practices. Um, I put a, a link here to um, a page on the Every Child Ready to Read Ning, which I definitely encourage you to check out if you want more resources, um, that has, they call it Every Child Ready to Read Games, and they just basically set up stations around the room, five, one for each of the parenting practices, and they encourage families to work their way through them. So it can really be kind of self-driven. You don't have to do a formal spiel like this, unless that suits your community or that suits the situation. You can really just invite parents to explore the practices with their kids. And I think that's one of the most successful ways to share them. Any questions about that? So one other thing that libraries are doing um, to include those parenting practices in their summer reading program is to tailor their Read to Me or their Early Lit program to the practices. So this is um, a draft of Pratt's summer reading game board um, for early literacy. And you can see at the bottom that there are suggested activities that support read, write, talk, sing, and play. Um, and so what we've kind of done with our summer reading program is rather than requiring number of titles read or minutes read, we just ask parents to either share a book or a story or one of these activities with their child every day and to mark off each day that they do that. And then we reward based on that system. So I know, I think St. Mary's County uses this, is that right? For their, they use um, the five parenting practices, I think. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and I think Baltimore County is going to use one this summer, is that right? Yeah, yeah, so it's definitely picking up steam. So that's one way, again, you're not formally offering a training on the literacy practices, but you're still kind of reinforcing them by asking parents to do that as a way to get their prizes for summer reading. So that's another thing. 
So if you're going to take this outside of your library, there's a lot of opportunities. You can certainly train child care providers or community stakeholders. Um, I know there's a library system somewhere in the state that actually trained all of their staff on every child ready to read, including their janitors, their shipping crew, everything, so that the system had an appreciation for how important this was. Um, so you can really take it to anyone you want to. The, are, is anyone familiar with Maryland Excels? A little bit, some of you guys? Okay, so this is um, a credentialing system for child care providers that essentially they get kind of rated on how many credentials they have in the system and parents can go on and see, I think it's like check marks, I think it was like five check marks max they can get, how many check marks they have and how credentialed they are. And one of the ways they get more credentialing or get another one of those check marks is if they um, take trainings for credit for their staff. So you can actually apply to be one of these trainers through MSDE. It's kind of a laborious process, but um, the curriculum is kind of already packed, so that's one of the things that they look for is what, what does the curriculum have, and is it evidence-based, and so on, which every child ready to read is. So you might get more child care providers participating if they know they're going to credit for it. So I would encourage you, if that's something that your system is really valuing and investing in, that you think about getting um, your uh, program approved for Maryland Excel's training. You can also use it for outreach for your bookmobile or anytime you go out to festivals, you can share the parenting practices, hand out some of those pamphlets, you can tailor things to your own system, um, give people tip cards and things like that. So definitely feel free to do that as well. Um, one thing we've done in Baltimore is we've really embraced it as a community brand. So rather than having every different child care organization talking about early literacy differently, we advocated that they use the five parenting practices. So um, we put together posters, they're in WIC clinics, and they're in daycares, they're in Baltimore and Toddler sites, they're in all of our libraries, so that we're kind of branding the city with those practices. I know Carol has a similar poster that they did in, in um, collaboration with other organizations too. Um, so if you're interested in this, or want to develop one, or share one, I know Dorothy had sent out Carol Counties, I'm sure you can get it from her, I can share this with you. Um, if you're interested in having a sample or tweaking it for your um, system. Um, you can also build kits around the practices. We've done that too. We had kits handed out to home visiting staff through the health department in Baltimore City, and each kit had five pieces, and each of the pieces was tailored to one of the five parenting practices. So for example, for the reading um, kit, they got a book, and then they got those kind of float and stick letters that you can use in the bathtub. Um, and then they get like a tip sheet of things that they can share with their kids at home, similar to the slides that I showed you. Um, so those are going out through home health visitors. So that's another way that you can kind of push the parenting practices to a population you might not normally see. You do have to have some cash to be able to do that, but there's lots of grant money out there for something like that. And then I did also want to show you um, that Baltimore County has done something really cool. They've made videos that they also made available to all library systems that it each kind of demonstrate and model the five parenting practices. So make sure that you check those out. I can show you the website um, real quick so you see where that is. You can see they have all of the, you, know, you can see the five practices right across the bottom. There's a nice introduction for each one, and then it does go through, you know, you can see the dad and his kid, they're modeling um, one of the practices. So that's a great one. You can use those if you kind of hate the reading one from the curriculum. Um, you could supplement maybe something with these. These are, are really nice. They were professionally done, um, and they're, they're very high quality, so I'd recommend sharing those too if you're interested. Um, it's Baltimore County Public Library's website. So if you go to bcpl.info and then you go to their kids tab, there's birth to five resources and that's where it is. Are those, I'm sorry, are those the videos from the, um, the DVD that comes? No, Baltimore the County did, they did their own. They did their own, oh, okay. which is why I say they're very high quality. They, they're like professional grade, they're very well done. Okay. Any questions about sharing it outside of the library or any of those things I showed you? Yes. 
So the STEM stations, are they permanent fixtures in the library, or are they things they check out? Uh, no, they're permanent. permanent. Oh, that's cool. No, they're permanent. They're they they are not for No, it is more like a new space because subjects, and then every other month or every month, it's in their library, in the children's section, we display the idea. Got it. For example, um, they, at the Davis Library, of course, you want the tornado, mm -hmm. the simple concept is to take two little bottles with the colored water, when you swing and then flip down, it will show the tornado effect. It always puts us like a pizza press for cat in the field, mm -hmm. and we display the related books. Oh, that's a great idea. So kids love it, and also right now we are in photography. The next one will be crosses um, and things like that. Oh, we cool. Have we already have the very of the prototype, the flyers and everything. That's nice. That's nice. So I don't know if you guys can hear all that, but they have um, STEM kits, and they're using them. They're kind of there's six of them that are in the children's department where kids can kind of interact with them. So one was like a tornado for weather, where they kind of have two bottles with the colored water where you can spin it and shake it, and it makes like a tornado. Um, so they're they're sharing those around. All of the, all the branches have them now, or will have, have them. Have all the branches will have them. Right now, only one branch. Got it. They will all have them. And that's something you could do too with, with this. You know, if you wanted to do five parenting practices as little stations in your library and children's department and have a different one and swap them around, you could do that too. Absolutely. Okay, so I wanted to just make sure I reiterated that you should check out the Every Child Ready to Read Ning. Um, it's everychildreadytoread.ning.com. I think you do have to sign up for it and just get approved to be a member, but then there's tons of resources there. You can download things, those games I mentioned are there. Um, there's a, com a community so you can post questions um, and get answers there too. So I just want to make sure I pointed that out. So with that, we have just a couple minutes left if anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to raise or comments. Okay. You're like, I'm, it's after lunch and it's hot in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hot in here. You're welcome. Well, if there aren't any questions, I will let you all go. Thank you so much for coming.